Hello. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Heik Lindingers. I'm a co-founder of Neon. Uh, glad to be here. Glad to sponsor the conference. Uh, today, what I want to talk about is uh, serverless Postgres. That's kind of the tagline we use at Neon. Like, we are a cloud provider. We provide Postgres. Uh, if you need the Postgres database, go to our website, click a button, you'll have a Postgres database. Uh, but the kind of one special thing we do is we try to make it serverless. Um, what does that mean? Well, if you look at the modern cloud architecture, it kind of looks something like this. Uh, you will probably have an application that is probably written in Java, uh, JavaScript, TypeScript, one of those things. Angular or Next.js would be involved, uh, something like that, or something else, but that's very typical nowadays. You would probably be hosting a backend at Verizon, Netlify, Cloudflare Workers, there's a ton of other providers, one of those things, or maybe you're hosting it yourself. Uh, but this is a very common stack. You will probably also have serverless functions, edge workers. Then when you go down the stack, there's commonly a Redis cache, like you see that in many applications, maybe Kafka, message queues, whatnot, object storage. But at the end of the day, what everyone just tends to run is Postgres, because that's where you host your important data. That's kind of the crown jewels of your whole operation. Uh, so people want to have something that's very stable, capable, and so forth, and so they want to have Postgres there. Uh, so what does it mean to be serverless Postgres? Uh, it can be a lot of things. Like everyone knows that there is no such thing as serverless. Like all software at the end of the day runs somewhere, probably a server. If you are running some kind of a server operation, you have a server somewhere. Uh, but what, so what, what does this actually mean? So there's a lot of related concepts. Uh, stateless is another buzzword you hear. And serverless and stateless are kind of the same or similar things. Like if you have a, if you have a stateless application, you will probably want to run it in a serverless manner. But what it really means is that you are not thinking in terms of, you know, renting a server somewhere and choosing a size. Uh, but what you are thinking of is some kind of service. So you are connecting your application to a database service. It probably means it's just like a connection string somewhere that you copy paste to your application and now you can connect. But you're not thinking about what is the size of this and you're probably not paying attention to the CPU usage of the box or choosing the size or you know, the brand of network device or whatnot. Uh, it's just a service and you expect it to be there and you expect it to run when you need it to run. Kind of another, another important part of this is that you're probably expecting to pay for usage rather than you know, a certain size of a server. Whether it's, uh, oh, like some services do, do this for databases like uh, per rows, like how, many, how big is your database, how many rows, or how many transactions per second. Uh, at Neon, we, we charge you for CPU hour. Or, but if you are running a serverless service or using a serverless service, you probably expect to be charged by usage and not by some kind of a capacity. So kind of from the flip side, what you don't expect to have in a serverless system is any kind of stop or start operations. It's a service. You expect it to always be there when you create it. Maybe you'll have some kind of a pause function or something to kind of deny access if you need to, but generally you don't need to worry about starting or stopping servers or setting them up or you know doing, doing stuff like that. Also, no choosing a size. Ideally, you would want it to be just scale automatically. Like if you add more load, it will just scale and you'll just pay for that. Uh, so no tuning, no scaling necessary. That's kind of what you would expect from a serverless system. Now, if you look back at what does the stack look like, uh, with these edge workers, serverless functions, what you typically have is very short-lived connections. Like if you have an edge function or something that connects to your database, it will connect to your database and run one query and then it will go away again. Uh, also, what you will typically have is like you would like to do HTTP queries, so you will might need some kind of a graph. You know, this is like why GraphQL is a thing and uh, people build Postgres other that kind of stuff, so that they can use HTTP uh, to run queries. Some of these like infrastructures, Cloudflare workers and stuff, they don't even let you open arbitrary TCP connections, so you kind of don't have a choice. You have to connect through HTTP or you can't. One thing that is important is latency. Like these, 
these applications are user facing, like they're typically web applications, and that means that there is a user, you know, clicking a button and expecting something to happen. So they tend to be very latency sensitive, uh, and uh, like the cold start times matter a lot. If you're using serverless functions, it takes probably 100 milliseconds or starting to start up uh, on the first call if it's cold. Same with the database. It, the first first uh, time to get to the first query, get the first result matters a lot for these these applications. And finally, auto scaling, like you don't want to be, you know, changing your configuration settings, uh, and the workload can change over time a lot. So what do we do at Neon? We are kind of providing that illusion of a serverless Postgres. Uh, you know, Postgres is an old school database system. It's not written that way. It's not kind of uh, designed to be like that from the beginning. But it turns out it's not. It's possible to do that. It's possible to run it in a serverless fashion and kind of create that illusion for, for your application so that you get the serverless experience uh, from Postgres. To do that, we've done a few things. Like we separated the compute part, so we have our separate, like, our own Neon storage system, which can uh, do that. Um, it can provide the cold start times, and it can provide uh, very fast startup times. So we can spin up a new Postgres instance in under one second. I think it's like 700 milliseconds or 500 at the moment, uh, like from scratch. If it's not running, provisioning a new VM, put Postgres on it, connect it to the right tenant, and connect your application to it. Uh, the other thing we do, we suspend it after five minutes of inactivity. Very important, like if you ever provisioned a very large instance at the cloud provider and forgot about it, uh, you know, you will appreciate this feature. Uh, but even for stuff like running Postgres as part of your CI CD workflow, like you, it's very handy that you can, uh, it will run only when, you, when there's actually someone trying to connect to it. And it, after that, it will automatically suspend and you don't need to worry about that. So I said that these connections tend to be very short-lived. Here's a graph I actually took from last Friday evening uh, from one of our regions, EU Central 1. It shows you how long has each of the instances we run in production has been running. Uh, so you can see that there is a lot of instances that have been running for less than five minutes, and then there's a large drop. That's because we have the automatic suspend after five minutes. It basically means that there's a lot of a lot of queries where you, people just connect, run one query, maybe two queries, and then nothing. And we can do that, like we can support that very easily. Uh, it doesn't cost us much, we only keep it running for a few minutes while you need it, and then we, we shut it off again. And then there's a long tail that goes, uh, you know, that's for more permanent workloads. And actually that tail goes all the way down, you know, back to the last minor release, which was like a month ago now. Uh, and then at the end of that, there would be another spike, which is not visible. That's all the server instances that are actually continuously used, and there's a continuous load, uh, and we, we kind of never shut them down. But everything else is pretty short-lived. So Neon can kind of support this, this use case where you have a lot of short-lived uh, instances, and we can create them and, and uh, kill them easily. So how do we do that? Uh, I said Postgres has a traditional, you know, very traditional architecture. So we've done a few things. We separated the storage so you don't have the local list to worry about. Uh, we, um, the storage system takes care of the right ahead logging, crash recoveries, uh, while archive, all of that for you. So you don't need to configure and tune those yourself and you don't need to ever do while replay uh, when you're starting up. So that makes the startup very fast. Um, we run Postgres in a VM and then we can resize the VM for you, so you don't need to choose a size beforehand. Uh, we can just uh, change it on the fly. Uh, uh, then we have a bunch of layers of caching for, uh, to be able to change the size of shared buffers, basically. Like, we don't do that, but we have another level of cache that we can change on the fly uh, as needed. Uh, we provide all of, like, we run PG Bouncer for you. We have our own proxy in front of it like, to manage these connections. We provide an HTTP API for these serverless functions that want to use that uh, if they can't connect using the Postgres protocol. Uh, so we, we've kind of solved all of these problems one by one to, to provide that, that illusion. So there's one thing I want to talk about because I know there's a lot of developers here uh, in the audience, which is connection management. And this is kind of a sore point for Postgres and for us especially. 
but, that, uh, but I think everyone is having the same problems. Um, Postgres has a pretty low limit of number of connections. It defaults to 100, but this is like one of the basic settings that everyone has to tune when they run Postgres. Uh, you can raise it, but then you start to get other problems. This means you need a connection pooler, like we run PG Barnser. Uh, but this continues to be a problem. Like even with PG Barnser, now you have to configure PG Barnser. It's just not automatic. Uh, so for us, it's very hard to find a set of settings that kind of just works for everyone. And that's a bit painful. I think everyone is having the same problems. You have the, these are settings you have to tune today, and I wish it wasn't so. I wish we could make it so that you just connect and run queries and don't need to worry about these limits and, and, and settings. It's not trivial. Like connection state has a, uh, a connection has a lot of state, uh, and you know anyone who has worked on PG Barns or other poolers will know this. So there's prepared statements, cursors, all kinds of state associated with with the connection, uh, and this is a problem for connection pooling. But it's actually fine in practice uh, because. Uh, the caches, prepared statements, like uh, those are solved problems. But then there's a fun bunch of features like cursors, per connection settings, uh, roles, which are uh, hard uh, to do connection pooling for. But the serverless application doesn't actually want to use those features anyway. Like the kind of workloads you have is like you, it would be very weird for a serverless function to open a cursor and keep it open for a long time. We just don't do that. So in practice, it works out fine with the connection poolers, uh, but as a like a Postgres hacker, that's a bit concerning because I know that there's all these features that kind of don't actually work if you try to use them. So that's kind of my wish list for future Postgres versions. Like I, I, I hope we would spend more time on connection management, pooling, make Postgres more pooler friendly, maybe disable some of those features, or maybe integrate the connection pooler into Postgres itself stuff like that, and, and not add new tuning knobs. Uh, that's something that a lot of people keep proposing, like adding knobs to kind of tune different parts of Postgres, but I wish we didn't do that. I hope we can also in the future find ways to make Postgres just work with the defaults, you know, reasonably well. I'm sure there's always a power user who wants to tune every little, you know, squeeze every little uh, drip of performance out of it, but if we can make it work, in the common cases with you know 75% of the maximum performance that's a great that's a great outcome and in general let's just try to continue to be awesome like in all ways like postgres is a stable stable product our customers love it uh, and we have very few problems with it which is nice let let's not break that let's keep it stable and uh, continue to to work on it that's really all i had uh, thank you uh, if you want to try it out there's a well, command to connect to Neon, or you can use a browser to uh, neon.tech. We are also hiring. Uh, go to follow the link. Thank you. Uh, you can't, you, uh, 